Hey guys, today we are moving on to chapter four, which is all about single gene inheritance. Um, this is section one, following the inheritance of one gene. So pretty much what we're going to do is introduce the history of genetics and then start talking about some of the important terms you'll need to know pretty much from here on out. All right. So let's get going, then, shall we? So modern genetics is actually attributed to a man named Gregor Mendel. Now, as you can see, he was a monk. Um, he was born in what is now considered the Czech Republic. And he grew up in a very agricultural community. Hi, Ricky. A very agricultural community. So a lot of farming, a lot of working of the land. He became a priest and a teacher at a local monastery, but he was also very learned. He took courses in a variety of different subjects, such as botany, which is the study of plants, physics, as well as mathematics at the University of Vienna. But he still continued to work at the monastery. He lived there, he worked there, he taught there. He also tended the garden there, especially with his agricultural background. He really kind of took to it. He nursed the garden. He tended to it. He gathered the fruits, all of it. But something he also noticed was the traits of some of the plants, especially the common garden pea. And what he noticed is that there were a variety of traits and certain pea plants would always have the same traits and other pea plants would have completely different traits. Now, these were self-fertilizing plants, which meant that the pollen of one flower would fertilize that same flower. So what he decided to do was to carry out hybridization experiments. And that's where he took the pollen from one pea plant and actually used it to fertilize a completely different pea plant. He did many trials of this. He made lots of observations, collected a whole bunch of data, and the different hypotheses and conclusions that he made actually went on to become the laws of inheritance in modern genetics, which is why we consider Gregor Mendel the father of modern genetics. His work was lost for a period of time. Um, well, not lost, but he kept very good records, but he kept it all at the monastery and no one really ever saw it. But eventually in the 1900s, his work was found by three individuals, Korns, De Vries, and Shermack. And when they found his data and his conclusions, he act they actually went back, tried out the experiments themselves, found that they worked and that their conclusions matched his conclusions. But instead of taking credit for it, they actually gave credit to Mendo. And this is when the period of modern genetics begins, what we also call Mendelian genetics, named after Gregor Mendo. Hold on one moment. All right. Enjoy. My name is Gregor Mendel. I am considered the father of modern genetics. And by doing my studies at the monastery in the 1850s, we now have what is known as Mendelian genetics, which deals with how single gene inheritance occurs and how dominant and recessive traits are expressed. I rock, yeah. So that was Mendo. He was able to speak to us. Check that out. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the work he did. So again, he noticed with the garden peas that they were, they had very defined traits and they were different in different plants. But the most important thing that allowed for the, him to do his experiments with, with these is that they were self-fertilizing. Again, that means that one flower would fertilize itself 
this flower over here would fertilize itself. And that's why it was very, very easy to establish true breeding parental varieties. Now, if you look at the picture at the bottom, this is kind of giving you an, exa an example of the different traits that they had. So the peas themselves could either be smooth or kind of wrinkly or dented. They can be green or they can be yellow. Same with the pods, they can be green pods or yellow pods. The flowers can be white or purple. Um, they, the plants themselves either came as tall or short. So what we mean by true breeding parental varieties is that we know from the traits of this parent that all of the offspring will be the same. That's what we're talking about. So if we have a tall pea plant with smooth peas, that are green and has purple flowers, then every single seed from that plant will be a tall pea plant with smooth green peas and purple flowers. And what he started doing was what we call a mono-hybrid cross. So mono means one, hybrid means between two different parents. So instead of having these plants fertilize themselves, he would actually go out with like a little paintbrush or something, take pollen from one of the pea plants and actually use that to fertilize a completely separate pea plant, thus taking out the self-fertilization process. <clears throat> now with a monohybrid cross, we're only gonna focus on tracking one individual trait. So a hybrid cross involving a single tree trait with two expressions. And that's what we're talking about here. So we said that the plants either came as tall or short. Now that's one gene, that is one trait, height, but there are two variations, tall and short. Flower color is one trait, but there are two variations, purple and white. Um, pea color is one trait, but it comes in variations, green or yellow. The pea texture, one trait, comes in two variations, smooth or dented. So that's what we're talking about with this. We're looking at one trait, and he only tracked one trait at a time, but he looked at how the ratios of the traits were seen in future generations. All right, so his results. What he noticed is that it demonstrated what's called dominant and recessive behavior. What that means is that one of the variations is stronger and more likely to be seen than the other. So for instance, purple flowers were more likely to be seen than white flowers. Tall plants were more likely to be seen than white flower, or sorry, short plants and so on and so on. So that's what we're talking about with this, how one is more likely to be seen than the other. That's, we consider that one a dominant allele or a dominant trait, and the one that's less likely will, will be the recessive one. This also led to something called the law of segregation, which we'll get to in a moment. But again, with the dominant versus recessive, with the true breeding plants, Tall plants always had tall offspring. Short plants always had short offspring. But when he did the monohybrid crosses, he noticed that there were cases where tall plants had short offspring. So again, it's showing that there can be, more, more often than not, they had tall, but there's also a chance for them to have short. So again, it leads to the idea of certain traits being dominant versus the other. Now we mentioned the law of segregation. Now we know segregation means to separate. And what this is talking about is how homologous chromosomes, remember all of your chromosomes come in pairs, but the law of segregation says that during meiosis, we separate the homologous chromosomes so that either one or the other gets passed on to the offspring. You don't get both copies from one parent, you only get one. So during meiosis, we separate 
the homologous pairs and either this one or this one will be passed on to the offspring. That's what we're talking about, the law of segregation. If you look at the picture on the right-hand side, me with my camera, so here's the parents. <clears throat> they have two alleles, a capital Y and a lowercase y. Now during meiosis, we're gonna separate those because they're on, they're on homologous chromosomes. We're gonna separate them so that one gamete, one sex cell, has a capital Y and the other has the little y so that only one of them is passed down from each parent. <coughs> so we're separating our homologous pairs, in other words, making haploid gametes. Now he didn't know what to call these ideas, these things. So what he called them were elementins because they're the elements that make up an organism and its traits. <coughs> However, since his time, we have learned a lot more about them and we now call them genes or specifically alleles. Remember, alleles are just variations of genes. So there's a gene for eye color, but then there's different variations that lead to brown eyes versus blue eyes. All right, so here we go again, showing an example of the law of segregation. There are three homologous pairs we have the orange homologous pair, the teal homologous pair, and the green homologous pair. So the law of segregation says that during meiosis, we are going to separate the homologous pairs. So that means that instead of having two oranges, each of the gametes should only have one orange. And that's what we see here, one orange, one, one, one. Instead of having two teal, each one should each of the gametes should only have one. So we got that one and that one, that one and that one, and same with the green. So we went from having six total chromosomes, three homologous pairs, to only having three total chromosomes, one from each pair. And if you notice, there's a lot of variation here. They give you these color bands on the chromosomes so you can help track them. Red versus green, blue, light blue versus dark blue. And they didn't really offer a whole lot of variation to these, so sorry. But we have red, light blue, one of the purples, dark blue, purple, red, purple, green, light blue, green, dark blue, purple. So we can actually see how they can come together in different ways, but we'll get to that in a little bit. The point is, law of segregation, we separate the homologous pairs so that only one of each pair ends up in the offspring. All right, we got a lot of terms to cover here. These are very, very important words that you will need to know whenever you discuss genetics. So whether it's now, next chapter, chapter 13, these are very, very important terms. All right, so we have, first off, homozygous versus heterozygous. Now, homo means the same, and zygous refers to essentially what was in the zygote. So the, what we're saying is you have the same allele combination in the zygote. So homozygous, an individual possesses two identical alleles. So remember, we said that we can just kind of write alleles as a letter to help us more easily keep track of them. When you're talking about like big A, big A, little A, little A, those are purely for us to, they're symbol, symbolic to help us keep track of the alleles. So if you have two big A's, you have two of the same, exact same letter, exact same capitalization, you are homozygous for that trait. Two little a's, you are homozygous for that trait. Um, specifically, if you have two capital letters, if you look down at the picture on the left, then you are considered homozygous dominant because you have two dominant, two of the same dominant alleles. If you have two lower h's in this picture, you are homozygous recessive because you have two of the same recessive alleles. Heterozygous, hetero meaning different, and zygous, again, referring to the 
to the alleles in the zygote means that you have two different alleles, such as big A lily. Yes, they're both the letter A's, but they're written differently. One is capital, indicating the dominant variation. One is lowercase, indicating the recessive variation. So here we have, in the bottom right, a picture to show the difference. We have a capital H and a lowercase h, two different variations, meaning that this individual is heterozygous for that trait. All right, so phenotype. This is the actual outward expression. So a lot of times it's easy for kids to think of phenotype as the physical trait. So what is it that is being expressed? How do you see that expression? Um, a lot of times you'll use very descriptive words for this. A tall plant versus a short plant. Blue eyes versus brown eyes. Hairy versus not hairy. Um, smooth peas versus wrinkly peas. So this is actually how you would describe the trait, as opposed to genotype, which is the genetic makeup. So it's looking at the gene combination. In other words, the alleles. So whenever I ask you for a genotype, I should be seeing things like big A, big A, big A, little A, little A, little A. So you're going to use the symbols for the allele combinations as your genotype. And then how, what those mean, that's your phenotype. So if we look at this picture on the slide, this shows you the difference between genotype and phenotype. So you have big Y, big Y, for, or cross with little Y, little Y. That's a genotype. When you cross them, you get big Y, little Y. All the offspring will be big Y, little Y. Cross them again, and you end up getting 25% big Y, big Y, 50% big Y, little Y, 25% little Y, little Y. Notice we have a discussion and showing the genotypes, the allele combinations as opposed to this side, the phenotype. You have yellow crossed with green. We end up getting all yellow offspring. We cross those again, we get three-fourths or 75% yellow and 25% green. So genotype is the genetic alleles and phenotype is the description. Wild type refers to the most common form. Now, a lot of times this would be the dominant form, but that is not always the case. Um, it's just whatever is most common in a uh, population, sorry. So for instance, fruit flies can come in a few different variations, but this one with the red eyes and the longer wings that is considered the wild type. It is the one that is most commonly found in fruit flies. The shorter wings and the white eyes, it's not as common. So we take this and look at humans. Brown eyes are the wild type because most people have brown eyes. Um, now brown is actually dominant to blue eyes. Fingers, how many fingers on each hand does most people have? Most people have five fingers on each hand. That is wild type, that's the most common form. However, in this case, that's not the dominant. It's actually recessive to have five fingers. Polydactyl, which is more than five, is actually dominant. But because so many people in the population have just the recessive alleles, that's what, can, what gets passed down, which is why most of the population has five fingers. A mutant is a variant, uh, variant that has un, undergone a mutation. Remember, a mutation is simply a change in the DNA. Now, not all mutations have to occur at that given time. For instance, blue eyes are considered a mutation. Um, they're a variant that occurred a change in the DNA that occurred at some point. Now, I didn't necessarily, my genes didn't spontaneously mutate to give me blue eyes. I get them from my parents. Now, neither parent has them, but that's neither here nor there. That's because they were heterozygous. Anyways, 
regardless, they've actually tracked the blue eye gene and believe that the mutation that led to blue eyes occurred about 10,000-ish years ago. So about 10,000 years ago, there was a mutation in the DNA that led to this variation. Over time, it got passed on, and now blue eyes, although not as common as brown eyes, they're still not super rare. So it's not like it's, oh my goodness, blue eye person, or at least not here where we live. Um, here's another example of variations. In the middle, we have just a regular North American gray squirrel, cute, fluffy. To the right is an albino squirrel, so a mutation that actually prevents pigmentation of the fur. And to the left, we have a black squirrel. So it's a variation in what pigments are actually being produced and expressed. The gray one is the dominant one. It's also the most common one, so it's the wild type. Both of the other ones are variations, they're mutant varieties. All right. So, one more, let me try. All right, so the physical nature of meiosis explains the law of segregation. What we mean by that is the chromosome behavior, how you take the homologous chromosomes and you separate them. That explains the law of segregation. So if the law of seg segregation states that inherited characters or alleles separate during meiosis so that each offspring receives one copy of each allele from each parent. Now we've already talked about that because we've mentioned it earlier in this PowerPoint. So I'm not going to get into that a whole lot. We've looked at both these pictures already. You've probably seen these things before. If you haven't done them before, you might have seen them. If you haven't, that's fine. You're gonna to get to do lots and lots of Punnett squares in this class. All a Punnett square is, is a convenient method for diagramming a genetic cross. So when we do a Punnett square, we're actually doing a symbolic, or I don't wanna say symbolic, but almost like a chart version of meiosis where we separate the alleles for one gene and then show the different possible combinations of those alleles between mom and dad. Now, by looking at it, we are able to figure out the possible ratios, so the likelihood of certain genotypes and phenotypes being expressed. Now, if you look here, this flower has, is heterozygous. It has a big P, little p. It's purple. Now during meiosis, remember those are two genes, or two alleles for the same gene, but they're on different homologous chromosomes. So what happens during meiosis is we separate them. And that's why you write one, the big P, over the first column, and the other, the little P, over the second column, because you're separating them. Same thing for the mommy flower. She is also heterozygous, so big P, little P, during her meiosis, once again, those homologous chromosomes are gonna separate, which means the alleles are gonna separate. One gamete will get the big P, one gamete will get the little P. So you put one in front of the top row and one in front of the bottom row. Then you start distributing kind of like math. So you bring down this P, this big P, bring over this big P. You're gonna do the same thing, bring this big P over, this little P down, this big P over, or sorry, this big P down, little P over, little P over, little P down. And you always put a dominant allele first, always. It's just the conventions of it because it's dominant, it's more likely to be seen, so we always write it first. And what we get is big P, big P, big P, little P, big P, little P, little P, little P. So in terms of genotypes, we can say that there is a one-fourth, one, two, three, four, one-fourth or 25% chance of offspring being big P, big P as their genotype, a one, 
two out of four, so two out of four or one half possibility of the offspring having genotype big P, little p, and a one fourth or one, sorry, or 25% chance of being little p, little p as their genotype. You can also look at this in terms of phenotype. Now remember we said that if it's heterozygous, the dominant color or the dominant trait will be seen. So one, two, three out of four boxes are showing purple flowers. So that means that there is a three-fourths or 75% chance of the offspring being purple and a one-fourth chance of the offspring having white flowers. So for a monohybrid cross, specifically between heterozygous individuals, we always see this particular ratio. For the genotypic ratio, it's a one to one ratio. One out of four boxes are homozygous dominant. Two out of four boxes are heterozygous. One out of four boxes are homozygous recessive, and the phenotypic ratio is three to one. Now, again, kind of show that. We're gonna start from here, because here we're showing the true breeding parents. Cross them together, you get heterozygous parents. So if you have these heterozygous parents and you cross them, this is where you will get that ratio we just mentioned. So we cross them, big Y, little y, big Y, little y, Two big Ys are in that first box. Big Y comes down, little Y over. Big Y over, little Y down. Little Y over, little Y down. So we have one out of four chances of being big Y, big Y. Two out of four chances being big Y, little Y. And one out of four chances being little Y, little Y. So one, to one, the genotypic ratio. The phenotypic ratio, three out of four boxes are yellow, one out of four is green. So the three to three one ratio. All right, again, just another example, kind of showing what we've been talking about. A test cross reveals the presence of recessive genes in an individual with an unknown genotype if we cross them with a homozygous recessive genotype. What I mean by that is, let's say I have a, here we go, I'll just use this picture. I know that the pea plant has yellow peas, but I don't know, is it homozygous or dominant or is it heterozygous? Is it big Y, big Y, or is it big Y, little Y? I don't know. So what I can do is called a test cross. I can cross it with little Y, little Y. So with a green pea plant, it is recessive. Now if I cross it and I get out of a hundred seeds, all of them lead to plants with yellow peas, what do you think that tells me? If every single seed out of 100 seeds led to a plant that only produced yellow peas, that actually gives me a huge idea of what the parent genotype would have to be. That means that this one, this unknown parent, would have to be homozygous dominant. It would have to be big Y, big Y. That's the only way to get only, only yellow offspring. Now, I had another plant that had the dominant yellow pea color, but I don't know if it's homozygous dominant or is it heterozygous. I can do a test cross with this one. And maybe, so that means I'm gonna use a recessive parent to cross it with. Maybe this time out of 100 seeds, I get 65 that are yellow and 45, wait a minute, no, sorry, 55 that are yellow and 45 that are green. 
Well, now I have both yellow and green offspring. So that tells me right off the bat, even though it's not a perfect, you know, 50% to 50% ratio, it's close enough. And the fact that I get both colors, yellow plants and green plants, tells me that the unknown parents had to have a recessive allele to pass on. Otherwise, there'd be no way for recessive trait to be shown. You can only show a recessive trait if you have two recessive alleles. That means you get one from mom and one from dad. Well, that means that the unknown parent has to be heterozygous, big Y, little y. All right, that's it for the vocabulary um, and the introduction to single gene inheritance. I hope this helped you guys out. Um, if you have questions, let me know. Hit me up in our Google Classroom or through email. And if you want to take a closer look at some of these diagrams, I will be posting the link for this presentation in the description for the video. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you have any questions, just let me know. Otherwise, stay awesome, stay curious, and most importantly, stay safe and healthy. All right, you guys, take care. Bye-bye.